The Tom Woods Show, episode 502. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Code School can teach you a highly marketable skill, web technologies, in your spare time, cheaply, and you'll feel like you're playing a game instead of sitting in a classroom. Get your free account through tomwoods.com slash code. Welcome to episode 502. Tom Woods here. Today we're talking about the Stamp Act because believe it or not, it's been 250 years since the Stamp Act was passed by the British Parliament. Of course, we all know about the American resistance to it. So we're going to talk about that and what it all meant with our friend Kevin Gutzman. Kevin Gutzman, of course, is Professor of History and Chairman of the Department of History at Western Connecticut State University. He's the author of James Madison and the Making of America. He's also the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. He and I wrote a book together called Who Killed the Constitution? You can find out more about Kevin at kevingutzman.com. That's G-U-T-Z-M-A-N. Kevin is a faculty member at mylibertyclassroom.com, where you can learn the history and economics we did not get in school. This is, of course, totally different from the Ron Paul curriculum, which is a homeschool curriculum I've devised courses for. Liberty Classroom is older than this, and it's uh, it started in 2012. And it's primarily for adults, although we've had plenty of homeschoolers use it profitably. But it's really for people who feel like, I, I want to know real history. I want to know real economics, and there are a million books, and I'll never learn it if I don't have a systematic presentation of it that I can get to while I'm driving or doing something else. And that's why I devised Liberty Classroom, and it's expanded like crazy, huge amount of material there. It is a steal, what you're getting, and it's an even bigger steal if you use coupon code SHOW in all caps when you're over at libertyclassroom.com. Let's welcome Kevin back to the show right now. Kevin, thanks for being here. Really happy to be here, Tom. We're talking about the Stamp Act because I didn't realize it's 250 years since the Stamp Act, 1765. So, of course, we're going to have 250 years of everything coming up. We'll have 250 years of the Declaratory Act coming up, 250 years of a whole bunch of things. It'll be a good excuse to talk U.S. history with Kevin Gutzman. I think most people remember the Stamp Act from elementary school, from junior high. They have the basic gist of it. But give me the Kevin Gutzman gist of it. Well, do you want the details of the law itself, or do you want the background? Well, let's start with the background. I think that makes more sense. Okay, well, in 1763, the British won the Seven Years' War, but because they had won the war against France, which had vastly superior resources of every kind to Britain by inventing modern deficit finance, when the war ended, the British government couldn't cut taxes back to peacetime levels as people were accustomed to having it do when wars ended. So casting about for any expedient to lessen the load upon uh, English landowners, which meant people who were represented in or actually sat in Parliament, uh, they decided one expedient that might be worth a try was foisting some of the burden of the British fiscal problem off on the colonists. They tried in 1764 something called the Sugar Act, which meant immediate opposition, and so that was repealed. And then the following year came the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act was a a break with tradition because it was an internal tax on people in North America in regard to any kind of uh, use of paper, whether it was uh, using paper in making books, printing newspapers, filing legal papers, uh, printing college diplomas, making playing cards, or, or whatever other use people might make a paper. And besides that, they also had a stamp tax on dice. I'm not sure exactly how that worked. I've never seen a stamp die. But in any event, uh, that was the goal, was just to reap some kind of tax revenue from the North American colonists because, number one, the burden of British taxation fell on people in the class of people who were represented in Parliament in those days. Of course, Lords sat in the House of Lords, but the House of Commons, although very democratic in a European context in 1763, was very undemocratic from, by our lights. Only about 10% of British men were eligible to vote, and those were people who could demonstrate that they met a threshold of annual income. So it was precisely the people who were represented who were being taxed. 
And anyway, they had the idea that since the North American colonists were the chief beneficiaries of the Seven Years' War with the expulsion of France from North America and the likelihood that that would mean fewer in, uh, French instigated Indian attacks on North American colonies as well. Um, and because they hadn't been paying any direct taxes to the British, into the British Fisc at all, uh, it seemed to make sense to people in Parliament to tax the colonies. Now, this may sound like a reasonable thing on the part of the British to some people. The colonists obviously get some advantage here that was paid for by the British, so surely it's not unreasonable to expect them to pay their fair share. You can just hear people making that sort of argument. What do the colonists come back with? And by the way, we're all familiar with, quote, no taxation without representation. But I think the colonial complaint goes a little bit beyond that. Well, before I address that directly, let me just say a little bit of something about whether this is reasonable for the British. You know, people have the idea of George III as a tyrant. And of course, it's in all the high school and, and junior high textbooks, and uh, my freshman college students all tell me that George was oppressing the colonists and he was a horrible tyrant and so on. But if the colonists had actually paid all the taxes that the British tried to impose on them, between the Stamp Act and the Declaration of Independence. They wouldn't have been paying the whole cost of the British government. They wouldn't have been funding the whole debt of the British government. They wouldn't have been paying the whole cost of their own defense by the British government. They would have been paying about 10% of the cost of their own defense. And their argument was, well, we're entitled to have you continue to do this for free because that's our custom, and that's what the precedents all show that you're supposed to do. Now, you could ask us to send you money, and likely we would, but we are not going to accept any kind of taxation at all, although, of course, we expect to continue to have the advantage of being in the British Empire, and among other things, that'll mean having you defend us for free. All right, do I sense some cynicism here from Kevin Gutzman? <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it cynicism, but, you know, one thing one notices if studying constitutional history is that people's constitutional arguments tend to coincide neatly with their material interests. So uh, this is one illustration of that uh, fact. Um, now, of course, there were people in North America who pointed out that during the Seven Years' War, when the king had asked, for example, New York to provide uh, money and soldiers, New York had provided both more money and more soldiers than the king requested. So... From their point of view, it wasn't as if they had been unwilling to contribute to the expense of British government, but they were just completely unwilling to have the British government tell them to any extent that they must contribute anything. And um, from their point of view, of course, this went to the nature of the constitutional system. And actually what we're going to see here is that there's a major disjunct between the way the British people in Britain have come to understand the British Constitution and the way that the people in the North American colonies understand the British Constitution. So in the imperial crisis of 1764 to 1776, repeatedly the British will pass laws and try to enforce them in North America. And the North American colonists will point to their colonial charters or the commissions of various royal governors who've been sent to North America or statements made by kings from time to time or other kinds of precedents in defense of their position that they are entitled to what they call all the rights of Englishmen. And from the point of view of people in Britain, this didn't make any sense. It would have made sense to them before the glorious revolution of 1688 and 89 to point to precedents and charters and so on. But from 1688 and 89, the British had ceased to have this kind of traditional constitution and had come to have a different principle-based constitution, which was based on the idea of what's called parliamentary sovereignty. So under the traditional art kind of arguments that people in North America were going to dust off in the dispute with the British, the colonial assertions would have been accepted by people in England, but since the Glorious Revolution, this, this principle of parliamentary sovereignty was the defining characteristic of the British governmental system. And what parliamentary sovereignty meant essentially was, if it doesn't violate the laws of physics, then parliament can do whatever it wants. So uh, you can't assert 
that you have some local right to limit the authority of parliament, that's that's a solecism. It's, it's completely inconsistent with the most basic principle of the British government. We have these three institutions that crown the lords and the commons, and acting together, they make law. What kind of law can they make? Well, any kind of law they want. So, uh, really, the two groups end up talking past each other, and uh, this is clear from the very first dispute in the Imperial Crisis, the one over the Stamp Act. And, of course, as you will read in your textbook, the Stamp Act is almost designed to irritate the most influential people in the colonies, because, of course, if you're Put it, if, if these stamps are required on all legal documents, then the lawyers are up in arms, and you, now you've got newspaper editorial writers up in arms, and even tavern keepers, having to, which is where a lot of people are going to get some of their political views, having to get stamps for their licenses, now round out the three most influential groups of people. <laughs> so we do get quite an enormous, I mean, very, very angry response from the, from the colonies. Uh, so maybe you can say something about that. Sure, yes, and don't leave out people who are college graduates, uh, people who are, are ministers and want to publish their sermons. Essentially, all the literate people are the ones who are most affected. Um, so it's true that uh, virtually instantaneously, the North American colonists respond to the Stamp Act with three different kinds of resistance. First, on the most popular level, they have circulation, especially in Boston and in Tidewater, Virginia, meaning the, the coastal region of Virginia that extends from the ocean up to Fredericksburg and Georgetown and Richmond. Uh, the people who live east of those towns, um, they circulate petitions like the one that circulated in, in uh, Boston, or really a, a, what they call an association, saying we're going to boycott anything British. We're not going to buy anything British. We're not going to sell anything to Britain. We're not going to sell anything that's made in Britain um, because we hope to use economic coercion to get the Parliament to repeal this onerous, they say, onerous new law. But, you know, again, the interesting thing, I think, is, of course, we've all heard these arguments, and being Americans means that you're just kind of steeped in them. But look at this from the British point of view, which is really the more difficult thing to do for an American. Look, think about this from the British point of view. What could they do? Should they think, well, we should just continue to provide this expensive uh, benefit to the North American colonists without ever taxing them? Does that make sense? Okay, so ultimately what we get is uh, there's the Stamp Act Congress, but bef but other than the Stamp Act Congress, though, there are some, there's some more interesting things going on in... Uh, in the colonies in, individually, some statements being made. Uh, Patrick Henry, for example, making statements that not everybody's going to want to accept all of the claims that Patrick Henry makes, although by the time people find out about them later on, as information is not always reliable going up the colonies, Rhode Island, I'm pretty sure, passes all the uh, resolutions that were being considered in Virginia when, in fact, only four or five of them wound up being accepted in Virginia. Can you tell us about that? Well, I, again, you have three levels of resistance. So there's the popular level of the, the association or the boycott, which is mainly a phenomenon of Tidewater, Virginia, and Boston. Then you have a kind of intermediate level of resistance where some of the colonial legislatures, including the one in Virginia, led by this, who's ever heard of them before, uh, New Burgess, who's in its first week in the House of Burgess, is Patrick Henry. Uh, the, the resolutions that Henry pushes through over the objections of all the senior leadership in the Burgesses, the Speaker, the Attorney General, everybody who's anybody says, no, we don't like this, and still passes. These resolutions say not only that um, this colony was founded by its initial settlers through their own effort with their own money, we always had the pledges from the kings, including in the charters, but also in every governor's commission, that we would have all the rights of Englishmen. The rights of Englishmen include the right to trial by jury and the right to be taxed only by our own representatives. So this means that, here's the really controversial part, anybody who tries to enforce the Stamp Act within His Majesty's Colony of Virginia should be treated as an enemy to His Majesty's Colony. So that passed, too, on the first vote. And again, over uh, just extreme histrionics from the Speaker and the Attorney General and the other leaders of the House of Burgesses. So um, Henry had, had 
instantly thrown this firebrand into the haystack of uh, Virginia political uh, culture. The <laughs> ironic thing is <clears throat> that as was customary for a lot of the Burgesses in those days, and they're meeting in the summer about the time they need to be getting their tobacco crop in, and a lot of them would just go to Williamsburg, do a little bit of work, go home, do a little bit of work on the farm, go back to Williamsburg. So Henry left the day after these resolutions were passed, and in his absence, or after his departure, the leadership brought the last two, including the one about being an enemy to His Majesty's colony if you help to enforce the law, backed up and had them rescinded. But by then it was too late because there had been a ship in the James at Williamsburg and those initial resolutions, apparently this must have been Henry's doing, those initial resolutions were taken out of the colony and soon enough they were republished in Charlestown and in New York and in Boston and in Glasgow and ultimately in London. And people thought, even though it wasn't technically true, people thought that this remained the position of the most important colony. Virginia in those days was essentially of the magnitude within uh, British North America that, that Texas and California combined would be today. It was a, just a huge share of the significance of North American colonies. And so here they are um, because of this, who's ever heard of them, I said before, um, the Burgess, going on the record saying uh, that Essentially, if you're one of the British officials who try to enforce the Stamp Act, you're going to be treated as an outlaw. An enemy to His Majesty's colony meant an outlaw, somebody who, upon being seen, could be assaulted, could be killed, could be robbed. He didn't have the protection of law. And uh, essentially what this meant was that uh, the, the Virginia government was not going to tolerate the enforcement in, in Virginia of British a policy. So. Although this had been rescinded, it, it certainly instantly made its mark on the minds of people in other colonies and in Britain. Besides that, you mentioned that there was the Stamp Act Congress, and this was a result of cooperation between, again, Virginia and Massachusetts. Um, it met in the summer of 66 and uh, decided on several Stamp Act resolutions. Those were far more moderate than Henry's resolutions or the resolutions of a couple of other colonies' legislatures. I was just going to ask you about that. How do they compare? I, I knew the answer, but I, it's important to point that out. Yeah, but what they did was essentially go on the record to the effect that we love your majesty and we love the Protestant succession. We have all the duties of his subjects in Great Britain, but we also have all the rights of his subjects in Great Britain, and those include uh, the rights the trial by jury and the right to be taxed only by our own representatives. And here's the really interesting part. And then they said, because we cannot be represented in Parliament, that means we can only be taxed by our colonial legislatures. So, you know, kids in my introductory college courses have a difficult time with this because they were used to the idea that people in Hawaii are represented in Congress. Hawaii is far farther from D.C. than England is. But, of course, nowadays it's very easy to travel from Hawaii to Washington. And in those days, it took six weeks one way to get across the Atlantic. So it really was virtually impossible. And what this meant was that from the very beginning, the nine colonies that participated in the Stamp Act Congress were on the record saying, well, here's an obvious solution to this problem. We could just have, you know, Connecticut and Massachusetts and Georgia representatives in the parliament and they said no we won't accept that that's that's a non-starter and really there never was any serious discussion of what seems now to be an obvious solution to the problem of taxation without representation kevin before we go on let's pause for a minute and thank our sponsor hey everybody i've been promoting code school on the show because i love the idea of a private company that teaches highly marketable skills for dirt cheap whereas it costs the government like $20,000 a year to put somebody through a job training program, and then at the end of it, you hardly ever get the job you were trained for. Well, coding skills have never been in higher demand, but traditional computer science courses are often costly, time-consuming, they don't have the flexibility that you need. Well, Code School teaches it to you in a learn-by-doing format. They give you coding challenges that make learning both educational and memorable. 
It's for advanced developers, and it's for people who are just getting started who want to learn something that will give them a leg up in the job market. So check out Code School and get your free account through tomwoods.com slash code. All right, we've talked about two modes of resistance then. We've got the association, the boycott. We've got these uh, official remonstrances, but now there's a third, maybe more, I assume what you have in mind is a more direct action type of approach. Well, no, I meant the boycotts and then the colonial um, statements and then the Congress. So those are three. But well, well, what about uh, the treatment of the proposed stamp agents, for oh, example? Right. I mean, that's what I mean by direct action. Oh, right. Well, yes. Actually, one thing I left out in, in this regard is that the uh, the boycott wasn't exactly entirely voluntary either. That is, in in Boston... Sam Adams was a close political ally of the Longshoremen and the Stevedores, and essentially they went all around and kind of presented to Boston businessmen the, uh, you better take this option, option of signing on to the boycott. So uh, I think it's fair to say that we shouldn't think that the fact that um, every, but every significant businessman in Boston signed on to that was coincidental or, or necessarily reflected absolute unanimity among those people about what tactic to take in response to the Stamp Act. But yes, actually, the British government ultimately purchased stamped paper to send to each of the colonies. It hired ships to transport the stamped paper to each of the colonies. It appointed um, stamp agents in each of the colonies, including the Massachusetts governor's sons, for example. But then when that stamped paper made its way to North America, what happened was that people weren't allowed to distribute the paper. There was, shall we say, informal suasion. Um, Some people were beaten up. Some people were given warnings of physical violence. Um, And this was the beginning of what was going to be a pattern of resistance in which during the imperial crisis all the way up to 76, occasionally people who worked for the British government in official positions would find uh, you know, that their brick houses were pulled down or that they were burned in effigy in the town green while they were sitting 50 feet away. Or, you know, it, it must have been a really bracing experience to hear a crowd chanting your name, see uh, yourself being compared to the Pope, have your uh, effigy hung by the neck from a, a tree and then lit on fire. And so ultimately, in 12 of the colonies, these agents just ended up resigning. And what happened in Georgia was that as soon as the paper made its way to Georgia, the governor instantly seized it and put it in a warehouse and never made any attempt to distribute it. And we don't know what actually ultimately happened to it. But the bottom line is that the British paid a lot of money to try to implement this law, and it never reaped a single cent uh, of tax revenue from the Stamp Act. So the result was the repeal of the Stamp Act, and then the the issuance of the Declaratory Act, which more or less makes clear that the actual issue that was really at stake between the two sides hasn't really been resolved, despite the repeal of the Stamp Act. Well, that's right, and a lot of people didn't realize what had happened. When news of repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766 got to North America, there was celebration in all the major towns and some of the minor ones. I'm presently in Danbury, Connecticut. There was a parade here. There were fireworks in major towns like New York and Boston and Charlestown and so on. Um, But some politically and legally aware um, colonists realized that what the Declaratory Act said was that, uh, and well, the House of Commons passed legislation repealing the Stamp Act one day, and and then its very next vote, it passed a law called, called the Declaratory Act, which said that the British subjects in His Majesty's colonies in North America were subjects of the Crown and Parliament of Great Britain, which it was entitled to legislate for them, quote, in all cases whatsoever. So this claim of a right to tell the North American colonists what to do in any connection that came to mind uh, was, of course, uh, just a, a flat statement of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty that I mentioned before. This was the underlying principle of the British Constitution, and in fact, it still is today. The the British system says Parliament can do whatever it wants, so it's not very long, for example, since the House of Commons decided that it wanted to get rid of hereditary lords, and although there had been hereditary lords since 
the Norman invasion in 1066, there ceased to be hereditary lords within the last 10 years. And what kind of a formal amendment did that take? It didn't take any. It just took a statute. So um, the point is that popular opinion saw the repeal of the Stamp Act as a great victory, but people who actually understood Britain's legal and constitutional system realized that all that had really been evinced from uh, the British was making a formal declaration that they completely rejected the, uh, the constitutional principles that the Americans were basing their argument on. We don't accept, for example, if you say Parliament can legislate in all cases whatsoever, well, then what limitation uh, on Parliament's discretion comes from colonial charters or the, the history of kings saying that the subjects in, for example, Virginia will have all the rights of Englishmen or whatever? The answer is none. There are no limitations on Parliament's discretion, despite any kinds of precedents, despite any kinds of assurances, despite any kind of argument from theology or natural law or whatever other kind of source colonists might want to point to. So even though it's going to be another decade, more or less, um, until the Declaration of Independence, really already by the end of the Stamp Act crisis, both sides have laid out their completely developed positions on these questions, and there really isn't going to be any movement on either side all the way down to independence and, of course, all the way through independence. Is it fair to say, or is it um, an unwarranted extrapolation to say that the desire later on to have a written constitution was motivated in part by an express desire to avoid the pitfalls of the of this British system you've just described. Well, sure. The entire purpose of a written constitution is to place limits on the power of people in office. That's all it's for. So Britain had a famous constitutional system, and actually people at the day uh, in other countries, leading figures of the Enlightenment like Voltaire and Montesquieu and Catherine the Great in Russia, and you know, people generally agreed that Britain had the best constitution. But the Americans had seen, well, okay, it's true that Britain is a freer country than France or or Russia. But what good does that do if you're not one of the people who were actually <laughs> who were actually uh, represented in legislature. And so Americans decided they wanted a completely different kind of system, one in which there were only a few powers in the government and the government didn't have discretion to legislate in all cases whatsoever. And um, there were various other kinds of checks on the government's authority, such as uh, Republican responsibility of people in both houses of what in most cases were going to be bicameral legislatures and so on. Of course, if people want to know more about this and the whole dispute that led up to the American Revolution, the best thing they can do, I mean, they, there are books they can read, but who wants to do that? They should be taking your course on the American Revolution over at libertyclassroom.com, naturally. Well, I think that's right, of course. I agree completely. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin has got a course on the American Revolution, and he's got a course on... Uh, you did most of the course on U.S. history to 1877, and then you also did with Brian McClanahan a course on U.S. constitutional history, and we, we expect more from you in the future. But this is all stuff you can listen to while you're on the go, and you'll know more than anybody in the world, which is good in some ways, but it's a real burden in others. So, you know, always having to be the one who knows the answer to everything. You know, it's not as romantic as it sounds, but you'll feel a certain warm satisfaction, uh, no doubt, to knowing it. How is your book on Thomas Jefferson coming along? Well, I'm currently writing the final chapter that... Well, it won't necessarily be the ultimate chapter in the book, but I'm, it's the last one I need to complete. And so I certainly believe that I'm going to have the manuscript done by year's end, and that means it'll be published next year. Well, that's great. So this is, again, for a lot of people listening to these uh, much, much later, this is 2015, so Kevin's anticipating a 2016 release. Of course, we'll push that like crazy, because I know uh, folks listening to it will enjoy it. And we always enjoy talking to you, Kevin, so thanks for talking to us today. You're welcome, Tom. All right, a couple things before we get going today. The first is just a reminder, please check out libertyclassroom.com. This is exactly the thing you have been waiting for. 
If you are someone who wants to know more about this stuff, you've ever been in a situation where you feel tongue-tied, you don't quite know how to answer all the arguments being thrown at you, and you're tired of being intimidated and you just want to know stuff, but you don't know where to begin. Well, if you've ever been in that situation, that's what LibertyClassroom.com is for. It's courses that you can listen to on the go anytime you want. And then if you have any questions, you can ask them anytime you want in our discussion forums or in our live sessions. So it's a lot of fun and educational. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com and make sure and use coupon code SHOW in all caps to get the discount you're entitled to as a listener of this show. The second thing is I've been reading Thomas Sowell's brand new book, and now as I'm sitting here, the title of it escapes me. <laughs> it starts with the word wealth, and I can't remember the rest of it. But so I've got it at home, and I'm in the office as I'm doing this, but it's very interesting as always, and all I'll tell you is I'm going to do my darndest to get Soul onto the show. I've had a lot of people asking that, and he's notoriously difficult to get, but I'm doing my best to try to get him on the show because there's so much of interest that we can talk to him about. So I'm going to do my best with that. Keep your fingers crossed, and I hope to be able to tell you that Thomas Soul is our guest on an upcoming show. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.